coming up on this episode of Inside the Epicenter. The one place that we're not asymmetrical and that we're in fact both sides uh, in this conflict are under the same obligations is to love our enemies and to bless those who persecute us. Welcome to Inside the Epicenter with Joel Rosenberg, a podcast of the Joshua Fund, a ministry dedicated to blessing Israel and her neighbors in the name of Jesus. I'm Carl Muller, Executive Director of the Joshua Fund, and I'm joined on this episode by our founder, Joel Rosenberg. It's a very important time in Israel and the Middle East. Well, Joel, welcome. In the midst of everything that's going on right now in, in Israel and, and in this epicenter region, I think the question that keeps coming back to me and to many who are listening is how should evangelicals view Palestinians during this rocket war? I mean, what, what should our view biblically be about their situation? Well, that's a great question, and uh, I'm glad we're, we're, we're tackling it because um, it's easy if you're an evangelical or Christian from some other perspective that loves Israel to go into your football team or your soccer team or your baseball team mode, you, you know, you're rooting for the home team. Okay. And in a war, obviously, it pulls people to their camps. And there's nothing wrong with standing with Israel in this moment. Um, I think it's important. And I, obviously, I say that as an Israeli, but I say that as a follower of Christ because, you know, one side is a nation that's a legitimate nation state um, that just wants to live in peace and is trying actively to make peace with our Arab neighbors, and we're succeeding with many of them. But on the other side, is a terrorist organization or a series of terrorist organizations that are firing rockets and mortars at innocent civilians. Now, just by saying that, I've already frustrated some people that are listening to this, okay? So let's just be honest about that. But that's what I think this program is about is, well, how do we look at the Palestinians? How do we see it from their perspectives, particularly from the, the Palestinian Christians perspective, but from Palestinian Muslims as well? And what I mean by that is, in any conflict, if you have terrorists attacking innocent people, it's not wrong to stand with and support innocent people and their defense, right? That's the highest moral obligation of a government is to protect its citizens and its guests and its neighbor, you know, and it, it, the people that are, that are living in its society. Israel has every right and responsibility to protect the people that live here. And that's Jews and Arabs. Remember, 20% of our society are Arabs. Uh, so, you know, it's not like we're just protecting the Jews. No, no, we're protecting anybody that lives in Israel, 20% of whom are, are Arab Muslims, and, and, and a small percentage are Arab Christians. But it's also important to love our neighbors, okay? So let's just focus on Gaza. Uh, we're, we're looking at neighbors, Palestinian Muslims, and some small number of Christians who are don't support shooting rockets at Israel, who don't support terrorism, who don't support Hamas, but they live under a terror regime. They don't have the freedom of speech. They don't have freedom of worship. They don't have freedom of assembly. They don't have freedom of the press. They can't criticize. These people will cut your head off. They will shoot you in your in the back of your head or between your eyeballs. You don't have the freedom to speak out of it against Hamas or Islamic Jihad. And if they want to use your house or your kindergarten or your hospital to house rockets and shoot them, what are you supposed to do? So we need to have compassion mm. for our neighbors. We can love Israel and we can defend her right to be safe, and I do, but we need to love our neighbors who don't want this. But Jesus doesn't let us stop there, okay? He commands us to love our enemies. Hmm. This is an interesting thing at multiple levels, uh, uh, and, and Carl, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but, but hopefully I'm helping refresh people's thinking who are listening or watching, thinking, okay, you know, like, because some people are going, Palestinians, they're all your enemies. How can you even talk about them as neighbors? Well, I see them as neighbors, and they are literally my neighbors. I mean, I'm physically proximate to them. <laughs> but Jesus allows a person to see another person as an enemy. 
Mm -hmm. Jesus doesn't say in, when he's talking about loving enemies, and he mentions it multiple times in the scriptures, and how to interact with people that are oppressing you, that are attacking you, that are creating injustice, even occupying you. He tells us how to do this, but he doesn't say, listen, those people are misunderstood. They're, they're really your friends. You just don't see it. You're so blind. You're so racist. You're so narcissistic. You're so self-absorbed, whatever. No, they're, they're not enemy. No, he doesn't. He says, if you see them as an enemy, okay, they're an enemy. But I command you to love them. And you're like, I don't want to love them. <laughs> well, we can say that. But we have to remember that we have been purchased by the blood of Christ, who loved his enemies, who said from the cross, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So let me take a moment for the enemies, and then you can pull more on the, on, on the neighbor side. But I think it's important to see Palestinians in Gaza, I mean, elsewhere too, but let's just focus because as you and I are recording this, it's in the midst of this horrible war where, mm -hmm. yeah, we've... But as you and I record this, more than 1,500 rockets have been fired at Israel. But Israel has done more than 600 airstrikes in Gaza. So, you know, it's painful on both sides, right? And Gaza doesn't have an air force, and Gaza doesn't have an iron dome system to shoot down rockets. But they're a terrorist regime. They shouldn't have an air force. God forbid. They shouldn't have an iron dome system. <laughs> they, the way to have peace in Gaza is to disarm Hamas, hmm. to disarm the Islamic Jihad. If you disarm Israel, there will be no Israel. There will be genocide, okay? I'm not saying Israel does everything right. I'm not saying we're handling everything within this war mm -hmm. perfectly or correctly. But let's separate out. These are people made in the image of God. That's number one. Mm -hmm. Two, Jesus died on the cross for them. Remember where Philip was in Samaria preaching the gospel in the book of Acts? And then God says, I want you to go to Gaza. Why? Right because I want you to, okay? So Philip heads to Gaza, and on the road to Gaza, most Christians, we forget that the word Gaza is right in the book of Acts. Yeah. And on that road, uh, Philip, a Jewish follower of Jesus, meets someone who is not Jewish, and he is not a follower of Jesus. He's a, he's a high-ranking government official, and he's traveling this road, and he happens to be reading a scroll from the book of Isaiah. He's trying to know God. He's from a different religion, but he is curious, and he's trying to figure this out. What is the truth about God? How do I know him? And Philip sort of runs up to the motorcade, as it were, the ancient motorcade. It was, you know, uh, the chariot and all. And he says, uh, can I help you? He goes, yeah, yeah. I'm reading the book of Isaiah. Oh, okay, what, you know, are you understanding what you're reading? <laughs> How can I understand it unless someone in, explains it to me? How can I help? Yeah. And they talk about Isaiah 53, and the guy gets it. On the road to Gaza, he gets it, and he wants to be baptized. I, I want to follow Jesus, and I want to be baptized, and I'm going to take this message to my people. Now, that guy was not from Gaza. Okay, he was admittedly from Cush or what we would call as Ethiopia or Sudan. But it's interesting, right? So God loves these people. I know Gazans who know Jesus. Mm -hmm. The Joshua Fund has done a number of retreats and conferences for Palestinian pastors and ministry leaders and their wives. And there are a number of them that come to these retreats, these conferences from Gaza, if they get the legal permission from Israel, not to even enter Israel, but to enter the West Bank where we hold yeah. this annual conference. So interesting, so humbling to sit with yeah. people who love Jesus, who live in these apartment buildings where these rockets are being fired mm -hmm. from and where the bombs are coming in. These are neighbors. Some of them love Jesus. Some of them have no idea who Jesus is, except in the Muslim context. And some of them are enemies. And mm -hmm. we need to love them all no matter how we personally feel about their politics or their religion, right. we need to show compassion. And when I hear Christians on social media that have said, you know, nuke them until they glow or bomb them all, you know, mm. turn that Gaza into glass, like, that's insane. That is not yeah. biblical. You know, it's one thing to defend yourself. It's another right. thing to wish harm on, on millions of people who don't know any better. Yeah. They are lost. 
they're in darkness. No wonder some of them are terrorists, but we have hope. We yes. know how God changes lives. And I, all right, I better stop there. I'm just, yeah. now I'm just giving a whole sermon. And you're like, ask one question. You're like, I'm, I'm enjoying the sermon. Let me put it you, that way. Listen, but, listen you I'm going to turn it, it, around. It, it, yeah. You have been to Gaza, yes. right? I yes. have not. Yeah. Let me turn this around. Sure. Tell some stories of you mm. going with Brother Andrew yeah. to meet both believers and unbelievers and terrorists right. in Gaza. Sure. It was one of the highlights of uh, my opportunity to do ministry in the, in the Middle East, to be able to go not once but twice to Gaza and to have interactions there with, I remember clearly, one learns this uh, with experience, Joel, you'll get this as I've had, but you just don't say when you arrive at Ben Gurion Airport uh, why you're coming in, but you're saying, yeah, I'm going to a church dedication in Gaza City. They tend to, you know, bring you into a room and have uh, three we hours have a, of conversation. We have a U-turn with you. lane in the airport. Yeah. You turn <laughs> exactly. you right back around, you shoot back exactly. on the plane. Exactly. Hello. Thank you. Goodbye. Okay. Adios, muchacho. <laughs> but but to be very clear, I mean, I have met doctors, pastors, typical average citizens in Gaza who are followers of Jesus Christ, who love him dearly, and who are willing to continue to work on with the worst of conditions, as you said. I mean, when I was there over a decade ago now, uh, there was great unrest, great turmoil in that in that place. But there were men and women who loved Jesus, who were who were willing to work on behalf of reconciliation and for the Christian church and for for Jesus's uh, movement. I'm thinking about a specific person right now, and I, I don't want to use any names just because, again, no. there's there's so much challenge there. We used to say that they were doubly persecuted in that place because being a Palestinian Christian means to be uh, rejected by most everyone around you, unless you're historically part of a community there. And it's a such right. A you're rejected by Muslims, of course. Right, exactly. You're rejected by Israel, Jews, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you're often, not always, but often rejected by historic Christian denominations yes. who don't embrace the personal relationship aspect of the gospel exactly. and are and opposed, in, actively opposed to anybody who believes it or, or talks about it. Yeah, exactly. And, and in this conflict, we've seen so many people talk about how it's asymmetrical. Um, uh, this is an asymmetrical conflict that, that uh, Palestinians are poor and, and oppressed and Israel is wealthy and technologically superior. And, and this is an asymmetrical conflict. And, and, you know, I would say on a surface level, that appears to be true. But you just said it before, the one place that we're not asymmetrical, and that we're in fact, both sides uh, in this conflict are under the same obligations is to love our enemies and to bless those who persecute us. And I would say to any of my friends in the Christian community who are enraged and pointing fingers at Israel and all of my friends in the Christian community who are enraged and pointing fingers at Palestinians and, Ga and Hamas and Gaza, remember what Jesus says is look to yourself, put Jesus's yoke on your shoulders and love your enemies and bless those who persecute you. And that's what I love about the Joshua Fund. And, and as you, you know, that's our call is that we're here to bless Israel and her neighbors, uh, bless the neighbors and the enemies, if you will, of Israel. Hi, this is Joel Rosenberg. There is nothing more powerful than prayer. We serve a prayer hearing and a prayer answering God. So if you would, take a moment right now and pray for our many partners across the epicenter. Many of them regularly face persecution, harassment, and many, many difficulties. And your prayer could make a tremendous difference in the war against evils that face them. We know how the story ends. Let's pray to that end together. So since I've hijacked the interview, and I'm interviewing you now, I want to I want to go deeper. What is it like as an American, as an evangelical, first to cross through what's known as the Erez checkpoint? This is the, mm. the main uh, security checkpoint that's controlled by Israel, uh, in which sure. you have to clear through to enter uh, the territory of Gaza. Sure. 
my first impression to say is it, it is intimidating. It is an experience of, if I can bring the listeners to a picture of this, imagine a 30 or 40 yard long concrete channel um, with walls, you know, maybe 10 meters, uh, maybe, you know, high cameras all the way through. Uh, you walk a single file pretty much because it's not very wide. It's probably width of an average hallway in, in someone's home. Um, and you walk down this uh, channel with your luggage and you get to the other end. And in, in, and in one end, you have uh, IDF security forces and soldiers. And at the other end, you have Palestinian Authority um, security forces and soldiers. And uh, in, in many ways, it feels like crossing. I've, I've also been to North Korea, <laughs> and it feels like being in Panmunjom, uh, where wow. you're you're literally at the friction point between the the global forces that are weighed in on this very very small piece of land. At, at one level, and I haven't done it, but people I talk to, at one level, it's sort of like airport security, right? You're, all your luggage is being thoroughly examined. You're going through an X-ray machine. Your you're, you're things. You're going through a magnetometer, a, a metal detector, mm -hmm. but you're also entering. A zone. It's true that the Palestinian Authority controls the checkpoint on, the, on that side, but beyond that, this is Hamas country. This is territory not run by the Palestinian Authority, which for all its flaws and all its corruption and all its troubles is fairly moderate and fairly peaceful. They are, they are not the ones fomenting terror. Let's, I mean, just to be honest about it, right? we have to be fair. That's um, right. You're entering a zone that kicked out the Palestinian Authority and took over. These are Hamas terrorists. These are people dedicated to killing Christians, killing Jews. This is in their charter of existence from 1988 when they created this Palestinian Gaza version of the Muslim Brotherhood. Yes. So once you go into that side, you, you we, we would use the term no man's land, right? You, yeah. you have no protection. Right. You're not. Well, so from that moment, from once you clear this is your objective, but like for most people, like, yeah. I don't want to do it. Like, and, and, and the reason that security is so tight there is because, I mean, people have come in the other direction of with course. suicide bomber vests. I was um, going to say and that, they, yes. And, and the, the one woman w literally was trying to smuggle an alligator out of Gaza. I don't remember the, why. We, it was strapped to her body under, like, what we would think of sort of as a burqa, a niqab, right, but, right, but like the, the Muslim yeah. dress. And it, when we, she went through the, like the, 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 the scanning system, they're like, it's got an alligator <laughs> strapped to her body. Like, <laughs> what is going on here? Are, are we actually seeing an alligator on the x-ray here? Yeah. Well, so, I, I will tell you well, this Let's get you inside. We only have yeah. a few minutes. So, so yeah. let's get you. Yeah. When you were in there, yeah. you're sitting with people, tell us some stories. Yeah, well, I told you, you know, a little bit about meeting some of the doctors at the hospital and some of the work that they do. But the most fascinating story I've ever told about this was Brother Andrew, myself, a translator from a Bible society and and one of our board members at Open Doors. That was the organization I was working with. We're in Gaza and Brother Andrew got a phone call on his uh, cell phone and um, was invited to have a conversation with the founder of Islamic Jihad in Palestine, which I don't know if you ever, you know, when he got off the phone, we're like, what? <laughs> and so we went, we actually uh, drove to Southern Gaza and we went out of the city. We went to this uh, compound of the, the home of this uh, leader, met him and his paramilitary entourage. And uh, they, they had four or five of those guys uh, situated around the courtyard. Uh, while Brother Andrew and, and this uh, the sheikh basically sat down and uh, had a conversation. Long story short is there was a big bowl of dates which visited me several days later in a very uncomfortable way uh, physically. But, um, it but, reminds me of the Raiders of the Lost Ark movie, Bad Dates. <laughs> you know, bad Dates. Those were, those were poison, bad but dates. Still, still Yes, bad but dates. Uh, long story short is I listened as this leader shared from the Quran, his viewpoint on Christianity. And I listened as Brother Andrew uh, read from the Gospel of Luke and preached reconciliation and love to the founder of Islamic Jihad in Palestine. Crazy. There yeah. is no feeling that you can get from seeing this take place. And 
it was amazing and it was beautiful. And uh, of course, I don't know what the Spirit of God did with that message, but I do know that Brother Andrew faithfully and unequivocally brought the love of Jesus into a place that most Christians wouldn't even dream of doing. No, um, I, I wouldn't make so. it. I, I couldn't go in and I, I'd never get out. I mean, both as a Jew, as an evangelical, as an Israeli, it would never be allowed. You had an opportunity. Uh, because of the Open Door, uh, yes. you were the executive director of Open Doors USA, and, and Brother Andrew had a long history of God opening doors that you'd think, God won't open those doors, and even if he did, I'd never go through them. That's, that's crazy. <laughs> but well, God, Brother Andrew but, used to always tell me, we don't know which doors are open. We have to push on them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and so Not when he pushed... Still be open, sometimes that's kicking right. it a little bit and just seeing. That's right, exactly. You know, let me just, in just the time we have, um, and by the way, we need to do a podcast uh, about the life of Brother Andrew and how yes. he opened up ministry in Lebanon and in, and in Gaza. Go ahead, but I was going to mention... Can I just say, it, this week, Brother Andrew turns 93 years old. Wow, wow. And uh, as a mentor, as a man who inspired me, even as a young teenager at church camp, reading the comic book version of God Smuggler, being with Brother Andrew and seeing him, he is such an inspiration. And uh, yes, we do need to do a, a conversation about him at some point in time. Absolutely. And I'll just, I just want to wrap by saying, uh, before you came to the Joshua Fund, and when you were the executive director of Open Doors USA, you invited me to speak on what was going on in, in Israel, in the Middle East, in the Joshua Fund, but at, at an Open Doors USA conference and, and that you did out in California. And one of the things I loved about that, aside from spending time with you and Kim and, and, and your kids and all, was you introduced me to Brother Andrew. And, and I, mm. too, had grown up reading God Smuggler and thinking, uh, you know, I read James Bond books and I read God Smuggler. And I was like, I want to be James Bond for Jesus. Like, I don't know <laughs> how the whole thriller, spy, ministry person, how does that work? But somewhere in that intersection. And so anyway, maybe maybe I'm at that intersection now. I but think you're at that him, intersection now, brother. Yeah. Meeting him was so special. And one of the things I remember saying to him, because I'd read his book, Light Force, mm -hmm. which again, that might be the hook to do the podcast. But mm -hmm. Just to wrap up on this thought, I remember saying to him, Brother Andrew, you know, I've admired you for a long time and all your work in, in the communist world and everything and smuggling a million Bibles into communist China and all the rest. But when I read Light Force, I began thinking, I never even thought about praying for Yasser Arafat who was the head of the Palestinian Liberation Organization. Never even, it never dawned on me. And I, I thought myself as a reasonably, you know, faithful follower of Jesus. It didn't even occur to me. I never thought about praying for the leaders of Hamas or Islamic Jihad. And I told him, you not only changed my perspective, just because I thought, I didn't even know that was possible. I, I, I forgot that that's something I was supposed to do. But that's when right. I read also that you would go have these meetings, I remember he, I said, you, you talk about a time where you were invited to speak at a dinner of about 400 Hamas leaders in Gaza. Not only could I not do it, of course, but I said to him, weren't you afraid that a missile was going to come through the roof of the event? Like, yeah. you get the whole ball of wax, you get the whole Hamas leadership in one dinner party. And, yes. um, but he had faith. And, oh. and he shared the gospel of Jesus Christ with boldness, knowing that it was not his responsibility to convert anybody, just to make sure that they had heard. How can they believe, Paul said, how can they even believe if nobody tells them That's right. the gospel of Jesus Christ? And, and how will they, anyone tell them unless somebody is sent? And this was the heart, and it still is, but he's 93 and he's not quite as active as he was. But thank you. I, I love that story. I love. I appreciate you introducing me to him. It made a big impact on me, and it made a big impact on the Joshua Fund because we began mm -hmm. to think, wow, some things are possible that I never even dreamt of. Yes. Brother Andrew would pray audacious prayers, crazy prayers, and God opened doors. That, too, is another topic for another yes. podcast. <laughs> Well, Joel, I agree. And I would say there's many stories that we could share about that side of things. But what I'm so grateful for is your willingness to bring the balanced message of loving your enemies and your neighbors through the Joshua Fund and through the many things that you're doing. 
Uh, this is an important distinction for so many Christians that we miss. As you said, Brother Andrew once challenged me, have I prayed for bin Laden before, obviously, he was killed? But, you know, that's a challenge we all need to ask ourselves. Have we prayed for our enemies? Have we prayed for those that would, in the flesh, kill us? And in light of the fact that Jesus himself, you know, prayed for those that would kill him because they didn't know what they were doing. We also need to pray and have compassion, as Jesus did, for those that are distressed, downcast, and like sheep without a shepherd. So this is a time, a moment where all believers, and especially those of us that, uh, like in the Joshua Fund, we're committed to blessing Israel and her neighbors in the name of Jesus, to serve, to be the hands and feet of Jesus, to be the heart of Jesus, to bring that love to people around the world and in that, especially you began with the, how do we show love and compassion to Palestinians and I would just conclude with they are created in the image of God and God loves them and he has a plan for them and they may be innocent bystanders of this terror they may be active enemies of the gospel and, and of Israel like the Apostle Paul was before he mm -hmm. came to faith in Jesus Christ he was a religious terrorist and God changed <laughs> him. True. That's what he does. He changes people's lives. And as much as I love to report and analyze what's happening in this part of the world, I much prefer at the heart seeing God move. And that's what the Joshua Fund is all about, giving people a chance to at least hear the gospel and then strengthening those who know him as they operate as the church in this region. Carl, thank you for letting me interview you. You didn't expect <laughs> it, but uh, I, didn't. I, I really enjoyed this conversation and I hope it gave people a different perspective on Gaza, but also a different perspective on God. Yeah, amen, amen. Well, Joel, thank you. And thanks for the time that we've been able to share with our listeners. Thank you as a listener to this podcast. I wanna thank you. And if you found this podcast valuable, please get in touch with us. Let us know who you are. Uh, we've had some great emails come back from this podcast, as Joel said. What do you want us to talk about on this show? And do you have a question specifically that you want Joel or myself to answer? Go to thejoshuafund.com and click on contact us. And then feedback from you is so valuable. It gives us the ability to continue to develop and, and increase the impact of this podcast. If you want to check out our show notes, you can do that on every episode uh, in the app that you listen to this podcast on. Again, I just want to thank you for your time and for listening. On behalf of Joel Rosenberg, uh, this is Carl Muller from Inside the Epicenter. God bless. <laughs>